Well, it's my great pleasure now to welcome Sister Lorraine Garrisu and also Bonnie Maywald, uh, who's from the Australian Civil Military Centre and who played a civilian peacemaker role uh, in uh, Bougainville. And you also, Sister, are a peacemaker. Could we begin by saying, what happened in Bougainville? There was a conflict in Bougainville. What was that fight about? Uh, the conflict that uh, broke out as war in Bougainville was, um, it actually started as an economic crisis because of the, the, the mining, like BCL or Bougainville Copper Limited was mining in Bougainville for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And because the landowners were, not, were unhappy about the royalty, the payment for the land and uh, all that, so they started, you know, they started a, an armed unrest um, against the, the, the mining company. And how long did that fighting go on for? Uh, the fighting went on for almost 10 years. And uh, I mean, that's, that's just one aspect of the conflict on Bougainville. The other uh, aspect is there's always been a political struggle uh, for independence for Bougainville. It's been there for many years. And when this crisis started, it just, you know, added food, some more fuel onto what was already there. So that's why it, it turned into an armed conflict which lasted for 10 years. This conference is all about learning lessons from the past and in order to improve work in the future. And one of the lessons people want to learn is how do we bring peace back to communities that have been in conflict? In a moment, I want to ask you about your role. But first of all, Bonnie, explain, when did you get involved with Bougainville? When did you go there and what did you do? Okay. I was there actually as a civilian peace monitor uh, with the, the Bougainville Peace Monitoring Group. And that was a regional mission. It was an unarmed mission, uh, a very important aspect of it. Um, so it was defence supported, but the monitors themselves were civilians, usually from departments um, public service departments in Canberra, DFAT, Foreign Affairs, AusAid, um, Attorneys General, provided staff on secondment who were trained in the peace monitoring process during the ceasefire. So there was a ceasefire arrangement negotiated between PNG government and Bougainville parties um, and they had civilian peace monitors and defence support over a you know, three or four years to negotiate the peace agreement and to also discuss how arrangements might be considered for the political arrangements on Bougainville, whether or not the people on Bougainville wanted independence from PNG or whether they wanted some particular autonomous arrangement within PNG. And that process is still going on. So that we're talking about decades of work that is still continuing and should be finalised by 2020. I think a moment ago uh, I introduced you, Bonnie, as a civilian peacemaker rather than peace monitor. And I think it's because sitting with you, sister, I'm mindful that, that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And I, I want to turn to peacemaking now and, and find out what you did in your community to try to build peace and keep peace. Uh, when the conflict broke out on Bougainville, I was working with the women in the Catholic Church. I was like their national coordinator. And uh, because of the, um, we had to take up uh, emergency response because people were displaced, their homes were burned by the army, the VNC Defense Force or security forces, they called them because they were mixed with the police, army and police. And so we had to organize relief serv services for them and all that. And, and it, which was, you know, taking care of women and children. So, so housing, food, care. Yes, like they were placed in care centres. That's what we call them, care centres. And then uh, into the second year of the conflict, because we didn't realise that it was not going to stop, because the, the, the rebel, on, uh, rebel leaders on Bougainville, they started taking up arms, they made homemade guns and, you know, just started combating with the army. And so because of that, uh, we started organizing activities as holding meetings. We called them peace meetings. 
Uh, we held peace vigils like in the night by candlelight, praying for peace. We did things like that and we held peace marches, you know, to go and petition even the Papua New Guinea government or their representatives on Bougainville, uh, the army, the rebel leaders, to stop the violence. As a group of women? Oh, yes. And the, we, what we actually did was we mobilized the women throughout the island. Because in Bougainville, the, the women's network in the churches is right throughout the island from, at, from the village level, you know, grassroots level up all the way to the national level. And sister, is there, uh, is it part of your culture for women to have leadership roles? Uh, yes, because Bougainville is a, is a matriarchal society and women are the holders of the land. Uh, they make decisions over the land, they make decisions over the family, the clan. So naturally they are leaders. Because uh, I was wondering why uh, the men in conflict would listen to a group of women, but there was partly cultural, uh, a cultural factor and partly respect because of you being a religious. Did that help? Uh, yes, it, this hel helped at some level. But sometimes it didn't help because, I mean, there were men in the factions that had respect for women and there were also men in the faction that didn't have respect for women. But it, for me, it was basically about, uh, we have something that we call in our Melanesian, Melanesian society called uh, Melanesian diplomacy. It's how you go around talking to the men. And we do that all the time in our families, in our clans. You don't, you don't go and you scream at them or bark at them, you know. It's like going slowly behind the back of the leader and talking to the people with him to convince him that, you know, this is not the way to do it, but this is the way to do it. So for us, it was like that. And that's how we organized and mobilized the women. How, how important do you think that work by the women was, it was in bringing a treaty? Yeah, yeah, it was very important because by the year 19, 1995, there was no way that they could stop the violence, stop the fighting. Because now it just turned into a, you know, into an, a real armed conflict with, we know people were dying, were being killed in ambush. In, you know, there were massacres all over the island. So in that, that crisis, we lost 20, to 20,000 lives. That crisis cost 20,000 lives. So by the year 1995, we knew that it was not going to end. So what we did was, there was actually an intervention in 1994 where there was a regional uh, peacekeeping force. It was like a one-off. They had some people from like PT Tonga and Australia and New Zealand, they went on a ship and you know, tried to intervene and brought people together to a meeting. But then when that happened, right after that happened, the PNC Defense Post organized what they called Operation High Speed 2. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but they did this operation where they were going to wipe out the rebel faction, you know? And it, it didn't happen, it failed. And because of that uh, incident, the the rebel government and the rebel leaders just decided they didn't want to do any more dialogue, have any more dialogue, dialogue with, the, with the Papua New Guinea government, with anybody. They just didn't want. So that's when we, the women uh, from the churches, uh, we decided to organize a non-political uh, non body of women so me and a group of, there were like six of us, we got together women leaders from the three mainline churches. And the three mainline churches on Bougainville are the Catholic Church, Uniting Church, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So we, we got the women together and we formed a group. And we actually held, had, we held, had help from the, there was a, a, a Bougainville working group based in Sydney. And we got from, uh, help from them. They sent someone to Bougainville mm -hmm. and she came and she helped us to organize a workshop where we strategized on how we were going to intervene. So that by 1996, we were able to mobilize 700 women 
and we held a conference uh, in central Bougainville with 700 women advocating for an end to violence, end to the war, and for our leaders to come together and start the dialogue process so that they, we, you know, we can build peace. I, I can tell by your whole demeanour and the way you're telling this story, you are confident that this mobilisation of women has played a critical role in bringing peace and presumably in the ongoing maintenance of that peace. I suppose the obvious question in a conference that's about lessons learned is are there lessons we can learn from Bougainville that would apply elsewhere or is this a special case, a matrilineal society with female land ownership history, with respect for the Christian church across a number of groups, that in a way it's a unique set of circumstances. Can I ask you, Bonnie, first, and then I'll come to you, sister, are there lessons here applicable elsewhere? There are some special things about Bougainville. One of them is that traditionally, because the women didn't have blood on their hands, they were able to call for the peace whereas men had blood on their hands and they couldn't. So there is that Bougainville element. And at the same time as women within the church groups were active leaders, the male and female domain in Bougainville uh, is quite separate. And so when women helped form a peace, they were then being told by the Bougainville men to go back to their homes and the men would take the negotiations forward. So the women of Bougainville actually had to reclaim their position and role and their right to inform the negotiations and the peace agreement um, and that the men should listen to the women and not just say, go back to your homes. So um, when, I think if you look at recent, a recent parallel, I think in Liberia, where women joined, hand, joined hands across Christian and Muslim faith and sat on the road and placed their lives at risk um, and helped bring a peace to Liberia in a kind of a parallel to what happened in Bougainville, um, a very dramatic parallel. What uh, do you yeah. think? Can your story inspire other women in other situations? I think it can, and I'm. Uh, it's not just because of uh, the fact that we come from a, you know, from a society where women have, they, they have title and they have leadership roles. Uh, because it, from my own personal experience, it wasn't at all easy doing that. Like, I know that for the one, 12 months I was organizing this conference, I was like the main person, you know, going and talking to the army and using what we called coconut wireless, the boost telegraph. Because in those days, we didn't have mobile phone. So basically, we had to go pass by word of mouth. With, you know, response. We had responsible people who could take the message and run up the mountains, down, wherever they had to go. Or we, we had to send letters, you know, however. Mm. And uh, it wasn't easy in those days yeah. because we didn't have the kind of communication system that we have now. And also because, you know, the men, like, uh, they felt that, you know, they, uh, they owned the war and that we women shouldn't be interfering, you know. Like we, sometimes they looked at us like we were interfering pools. We didn't know what we were doing and that we were crazy mad. And yet there were some men who felt that, yes, women can do it because what Bonnie said, you know, we didn't fight the war. We didn't kill anybody. So, it, we, you know, we had nothing against anyone. So we were able to go up front and say, stop it, don't do it, this is not good, this is not right. So I, I think we, you know, other people can learn from Bougainville. Uh, uh, one quick personal question, and then I want to come to your work in trying to deal with violence within the home. The personal question is this, are you a leader in your community in any cultural way, or are you just a woman who's grown to be a leader? Do you know what I'm trying to yes. say there? Yes, I, I understand. Actually, I, I come from, in my clan, my uh, maternal grandmother is the matriarch. Okay. Uh, my, I come from a chiefly family, from both my mother's side and my father's side. Because you have authority, don't you? You yes. have natural authority. Yes, so when I was growing up, like, 
I was taught what I was taught Melanesian diplomacy. How do you do it as a woman within a society that says yes, women are the leaders, and yet open times we uh, there's a system within our uh, in our in our society. There's something within our society that says yes, it's true. You make the decisions, you make the last say, but you have we don't sit at the negotiating table. It's our men who sit at the negotiating table, and they come back to us. So as, you, as a leader in your, in your clan, when you are growing up, you are taught that Melanesian diplomacy. If, I, if you have to get a point across to the men at the table, how do you do it? Mm. It's almost like concentric circles, the men and the women. Yeah. You see, this whole conference is about transitions. And part of that is, is bringing societies that have been in conflict or after a, a crisis or of a, a flood, a fire, or whatever, bringing communities back to stabilisation. And this question is in my mind, is part of that not just peace on the streets, but peace in the homes? And as I understand it, the United Nations Security Council has passed a resolution a few years ago, 1325, and that's, it's trying to bring gender into these discussions. And as we go to this conference together, should we be talking about reducing violence in the home as part of stabilisation in the Solomons or in Afghanistan? God, you know, or is it a separate matter that's private and this, this conference is about the public? What do you... Do you want to go, Bonnie? Um, no, I think they're, they're intimately, intimately connected. Um, and um, it really is important that men and women learn positive ways of going forward together um, and whether that's recovering from a disaster situation or a conflict or a mix of both because often uh, particularly fragile and vulnerable countries that have serial disasters or serial conflict don't know what normal is anymore and um, so giving them space and time to learn how to relate to each other in positive ways that um, allow women and men, children and older people to all find uh, normal and stable ways of living are really important. And I just see it as all part of one spectrum. Um, what do you think? I, I feel exactly the same way. And I, I know from post, first-hand experience in Bougainville now, because of the fact that the trauma experienced by former combatants has never been dealt with properly, we still have that ongoing cycle of violence. And we do not forget that, like, there were, you know, young children growing up during the 10 years of the conflict. Mm -hmm. Today, these are the people who are suffering because they were traumatized. They, like, as Bonnie said, they know no other but violence. Yeah. So they think it's normal. Mm -hmm. And in Bougainville, like, we also, at our center, we work a lot with children and youth. And we try to help them understand that, no, that's not, you know, that's not a normal situation. Mm -hmm. The behavior, the antisocial behavior, violent behavior, that's not normal. That's not correct. This is the normal way. This is, you, you know, you have to be a normal person, a person, you know, that is not violent to, to be able to know that that's life. And, that's and, and is it your belief that the, the Australian Civil Military Centre, the host of this conference, that these issues about children, about women, should be equal? Equal. We, equal with all the other issues? It should be equal uh, with all the other issues because, and like, I also know that like within the Papua New Guinea Defence Force, all the men who, who fought in Bougainville have never been de-traumatised, well, however you, see, you say it, you, you, and it impacts on their families. You, you, you've jumped exactly to what I wanted to bring up as my last point, because we're, we're at a conference with lots of people in uniform from all over the world, and many of them have been working in very traumatic locations, either in, <coughs> excuse me, either in conflict situations or humanitarian responses and is part of stabilisation and transition assisting the civil and military teams to return to ordinary life. Is that an issue, Bonnie? Yes, it is an issue and, and we talk about 
um, getting people ready to do a response or to do a rapid response, but we also talk about how they come home, what they bring home with them, and how they need to process that mentally as well as physically get over some of the um, illnesses they may be carrying with them because they may have been exposed to all sorts of things. And it really is a whole of body and whole of mind kind of confrontation they've been through. And they need to come back to a normal family life. You almost need a little in-between period when you can talk to your family about what you've been through so they can understand a little bit of it and give you space and time to come back down to earth again in suburbia. Uh, so that kind of transition is an important tradition for people who've been uh, third party witnesses or part of the conflict. Just um, in, a, in a similar way, people of Bougainville need to be given time and space to find their new footing and decide on their new political space. Sister, in that future political history, let's say 20 years time, the next, the little girls of today and the little boys of today, when they're adults, do you dream of a time when men and women sit at the same negotiating table as equals? Or is that a, you know, a Western culture imposition? My thinking for the future is that I would like them to sit at the one table. And I also, I mean, in Bougainville, it happens in some families. Like in my immediate uh, family, my clan, there's no more Melanesian diplomacy. We, we come and we sit at the table and dialogue because all my family members, the people in my family who are my age, we've all been to school, to university and all that. And because of that educational background behind us, we are able to tell our older people it's no more like, before. We have to sit round table, discuss and reach consensus. So for the future of Bougainville, that's what we want to see. And uh, today in Bougainville, the women, we the women through the women's organizations are educating our women to do that. And not only the women, we are also educating men and getting them to what we are doing more and more often, even in, with the within the homes, in the communities, is getting them to relook at their gen the gender roles within the families, within the homes, or in relation to, you know, men and women and that. And in the Vatican too? Oh, <laughs> yes, very much, maybe. <laughs> Once you've sorted out Bougainville, go to Rome. <laughs> Uh, Sister yeah. Lorraine Garasu from uh, the Sisters of Nazareth and, and also Bonnie Maywell from the Centre. Thank you so much. That was very good. Thank you. Thank you.